Hello and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the class. I've uh, turned on the recording so we can record this lecture for other people who are uh, doing this course with us uh, on the e-learning portal. And of course, this recording is also available. <clears throat> it will also be available in our coursework section for in the Google Classroom for those who would like to go and listen to it again. So welcome, everybody. Um, we will pray and get started uh, in this class today. Uh, just uh, maybe Siddharth, would you like to please pray with all of us and we can start? So shall I pray? Oh yeah, I was just asking uh, Siddharth to pray so that uh, if you if your mic is okay, you can pray Siddharth. So can I pray? Yes, go ahead Siddharth, thanks. Oh, we can't hear you. Um, All right, um, so that we're not able to hear you. Um, uh, all right. Okay, no problem. All right, Manu, why don't you pray and then we will start. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I pray to you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I submit each one of us in your hand, Father God, Father God. Mm -hmm. And always pray to you, Lord Jesus. I submit also, sir, in your hand. And Lord Jesus, I allow your wisdom and knowledge in, in our life. Whatever we are going to learning, Holy Spirit, I pray to you, Lord Jesus. Help us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm just going to share my share my screen here, and uh, we will look at the notes and get started. All right, so we had one lecture last week as we introduced um, this course on urban church planting, and uh, as I mentioned. Um, we would not just be talking purely about church planting, but we would also kind of extend this, uh, whatever our learning is to starting any kind of urban ministry or urban missions. Uh, that when we say urban, we are talking about cities, um, uh, which today are very complex uh, areas because you have uh, all kinds of people, people from different parts of the country or uh, different countries that come and live in urban centers that we call as cities. And we may also include larger towns uh, in our country. We say, uh, you know, all of these are urban centers. So I just shared a little bit about uh, uh, my own experience, my own journey in serving in different uh, cities uh, over, the, over the years. And then we started last class in, in uh, our uh, second chapter where we emphasized the importance of depending on the Holy Spirit, right? And, uh, you know, we, in whatever we do uh, in the city, as we are reaching people, uh, we must learn to depend on the Holy Spirit because he is the director. He is our guide as we look at the city and as we uh, think about ways to minister in our cities or urban centers, which if you're in a larger town or in a city, uh, doesn't matter. Right? So we need to depend on the Holy Spirit. He will give us the wisdom. Now, we kind of uh, ended last class by just you know, highlighting that many times uh, we struggle of, in doing both, at least, uh, you know, uh, as I've uh, spoken to people and even in previous 
and classes when we uh, would interact, you know, students would express the, 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 ch the struggle of l listening to the Holy Spirit and as well as, you know, uh, uh, looking at the practical side, which is what we're going to spend a lot of time here in this course, as we talk about doing research and observing and strategizing and, you know, and, and we're talking about methods, um, yet at the same time, uh, we need to balance that out with listening to the Holy Spirit. Um, and that is something, you know, we must, uh, learn to do and uh, the challenge as i mentioned last time is sometimes uh, uh, some some you know we could tend to swing to either extremes sometimes we just tend to go and do things without listening to the holy spirit uh, uh, and then we end up spending a lot of time and effort in things we shouldn't be doing or we swing to the other extreme where we are sitting and waiting for the holy spirit to tell us something Whereas uh, he would speak to, speak to us if we go out there and, you know, just explore, uh, do some research or keep our eyes open and look on the fields, so to speak. And if we start exploring and, and just, just being there with people, then the Holy Spirit will speak to us and say, hey, this is what I want you to do. Go here, go there. So it is very important to depend on the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, the Spirit of God speaks to us in uh, many different ways. Um, I'll just share one example before we go forward. I remember, you know, as far as uh, our youth ministry uh, in our city, that uh, all people's church that we started in the youth ministry, um, way back, I think it was in uh, 2002, and I might share some of these stories as we go along. Um, uh, we, we, we were a very small church. We had just started uh, in 2001 in Bangalore city. So it was still a small number, maybe about 30 people. Um, and, uh, and as uh, you know, in, in 2002 or somewhere around that time, I could, you know, I could be off by a year, 2002 or 2003, I forget exactly. Uh, we just felt that, hey, we will, you know, again, this was something that we felt prompted to do. And this was around the month of February around uh, uh, Valentine's Day and you know generally everybody's talking about love and relationships and things like that so I remember that particular year we said you know we will host a seminar uh, uh, for young people in a hotel uh, and just invite young people to come and, we, and you know and uh, it was on uh, dating and marriage and that was a topic and this was back in 2003 so almost you know 20 years ago and to our surprise, about 70 young people just showed up. We don't even know, you know, we just did a little bit of promotion. We were a very small church congregation and you know, 70 young people showed up uh, to listen to this. And so that, that gave us an indication that, you know, when you start ad addressing a need, people respond to that. And so, you know, obviously young people had all these questions on dating and relationship from a biblical perspective. What is a church's perspective? And so they all showed up to listen, you know, and we had a wonderful time. The other thing around those days was we started out um, outreach in uh, coffee shops. And this was way back in uh, 2003. Uh, Cafe Coffee Day had just opened up in Bangalore City. So we went to them. We said, you know, can we just use your cafe? And this is not a Christian cafe. It's just, you know, a regular cafe. And can we use your cafe for two hours? Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to sing songs and all that, but we will have a group of people come and we will buy, you know, your your beverages and snacks. For them, it was, it meant business, you know, having people come into the coffee shop. Uh, for us, it was an outreach to young people. So, you know, I guess it worked well. And so that just grew. And I think within a matter of a year or so, uh, we had more than 100 young people show up and we, we went to the biggest cafe coffee day that was available in Bangalore City in those days. I think it was on Cunningham Road and that was the biggest one. Of course, many others have opened up since then, but uh, it was the largest one available in those days. And, you know, over 100 people squeezed into that coffee shop uh, and we would sing, we would preach from the word uh, and they would invite friends. And, you know, of course, we had a 
time of ministry, then we had time of you know refreshments and so on. So that again, that really, uh, the Lord was leading us. You know, as the Holy Spirit speaks, you step out, you do it, it'll grow. Now remember, we moved into auditorium because you know we had more people, young people come. We moved into an our regular auditorium. So now this became like a youth service. This was on Saturdays, and we were you know meeting in an auditorium. And so that's how the ministry grew. Uh, and uh, now, so I'm fast forwarding several years. In 2011, uh, we were having one of these youth services in the auditorium. And I remember, you know, I was up in front. This was towards the end of that particular youth service. I was up in front. The young people were there. And at that moment, uh, you know, it just was an idea that flashed into my mind. Why don't you take these youth services into college campuses? You know, so and, and there was no preparation, no thought. And I'm not saying, you know, everything is going to happen like this. Sometimes you need to go and plan and things like that. But it happened at that moment. And I knew the Holy Spirit was speaking. And the idea, the thought that came was, why don't you take this youth service into college campuses? Because instead of telling the young people to come to us, we go to them. And, you know, without even discussing with anybody, I just announced, I said, hey, are we going to take these youth services into college campuses? And uh, then, so that's, I, I just announced it and I had no idea how it's going to happen. But then immediately ideas came. This is how we go about doing it. So we reached out to some Christian colleges where the management is Christian. Of course, the college is a regular secular college. And we asked them, you know, we would like to come to your campus and uh, host a one-hour program for youth. We'll be talking about these things. It's going to be from the Bible and so on. And colleges began to open up, you know, so for, and, uh, you know, of course, in the college, you've got hundreds of students. So, for instance, when we went to one particular college, the auditorium was packed with 600 students. And there was no expense from our side other than sending a team of people to go there and minister. They gave us one hour to speak to the students. And we had a, you know, we, of course we had a planned, we planned out what we're gonna do in that one hour. There'd be worship, there'd be ministry of the word, praying and so on. Another college campus, there were 1,200 students in the auditorium, you know, and uh, young people. And uh, so again, we get an opportunity to speak. So like that, several college campuses opened up and we were taking, literally taking a youth service into those college campuses. And um, how did that idea come? It was from the Holy Spirit. It was a very spontaneous thing. It happened at the end of one youth service. Take these into college campuses. Then when we contacted the management of different college campuses, things just opened up and we were able to do it. So that's just, uh, you know, just giving you a little illustration of how at, as you, the ministry is progressing at different stages, the Holy Spirit can prompt ideas. And then, you know, of course, the idea comes, but then you also have to do a little bit of, you know, work in the sense of planning, how you developing a strategy, how are you going to speak to the management in different college campuses and get their permission, you know, fit it into their schedule, uh, and then so on, you know, how will you minister to the young people? So, uh, but then the idea came from the Holy Spirit. So you you kind of balance both as you're reaching out to people in the city, right? So let's move into chapter three uh, in this course on urban church planting as we uh, give some, you know, just, a little bit of definition and objectives of church planting. That means, you know, what are we trying to achieve here in the city or in towns? You know, now, uh, as we said in the very beginning, uh, uh, you know, the cities are very complex places because we have, uh, it, it is a melting pot or it is a, a gathering of people from different cultures, from different uh, languages, um, uh, you know, and they're all in the city. They all come there to work, to live their lives, to develop, uh, you know, have families uh, and so on. And they're all in the city. They all come to these towns and uh, people from various languages and cultures are there. So cities are very 
uh, most cities are very complex uh, uh, communities of people, diverse people, diverse cultures and people groups and all in that one uh, city. And most cities these days are huge. Uh, you know, there would be millions of people typically. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, what are we trying to do when we talk about having a Christian ministry, whether it's a church or a, some other ministry in an urban center? You know, what are we trying to do and how should we go about it? So those are things we want to just address in the very beginning. So Matthew 28 verses 18 to 20. Uh, these are very familiar verses. This is, this is the great commission. Could somebody read that for us? Matthew 28 verses 18 to 20, please. Yes, sir. And, and Jesus came, came and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me and in heaven on the earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. So this is, you know, we refer to this as the Great Commission. And Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations. So, you know, our heart must be for the nations, uh, for people across various parts of the world and um, uh, languages, cultures, races, uh, of all nations, go and make disciples. So that's what he left us with. That's the mandate he gave us. And so... When you go into the, when you look at the book of Acts, uh, Jesus left the, uh, the early disciples with this mandate, go and make disciples of all nations. And uh, when they started preaching, preaching the gospel, what we see happening in the book of Acts is that wherever they went proclaiming the gospel, they established communities of believers. Uh, uh, gathering of people who've, who'd been, who responded to the gospel and, you know, we call them local churches. So they established these communities of believers and it served several purposes. One, of course, was uh, uh, believers were nurtured in these communities, right? So they came to faith, they heard the gospel, they believed in Jesus. They didn't just said, okay, that's, that's enough, just go away. No, they assimilated them into communities of believers where these believers were nurtured and equipped. And then they in turn could influence their community. They in turn, in turn could be, could host God's presence, you know, be the dwelling place of God as the scripture says. They could be the dwelling place of God, the temple of God in their city or town or region, wherever they so what we refer to as local churches or communities of believers serve the purpose of nurturing new believers, of equipping believers, of influencing a community, of hosting God's presence in that community, being, you know, the, uh, the, the play, God, the represent, representation of God in, the, in that community. So when we talk about church planting today, this is what we are working towards. And we want in our cities, many such communities where there are believers who are able to be nurtured, equipped, uh, host the presence of God and influence their region or their sphere or their city and we want to do this in a self-sustaining way. That means these communities of believers that are established should not be dependent on some external source for their life and continuity. They should be self-sustaining. 
so when you look at a self-sustaining uh, church or a church plant, uh, we're looking at there, they should be self-sustaining in leadership. That means we want leadership from among them to lead the work. Maybe for a period of time, there would be external input and guidance to help develop the work. But then at some point, they should be self-sustaining in, in leadership. They should have their own leaders leading the work. They should become self-sustaining financially. Maybe for a period of time, money will come from outside, but eventually uh, the community should be able to sustain that themselves in, in, in the ministries that they are doing. And they should be self-sustaining in the community itself. That means it should keep on multiplying and growing uh, rather than depending on somebody else to come and stoke the fire and keep the fire burning. The community now should become you know, growing organically. New believers are added, people are growing, and it keeps expanding. So it becomes a self-sustaining community of believers. So this is what we are uh, you know, what we're talking about at church planting and what we're trying to achieve. Now, let me just uh, make a, 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 just a statement here about church planting. Some people use the term church planting. Uh, some people don't like that term. So they like to use the term pioneering, uh, starting a new work or a new local church or a new ministry. Now, we are going to be very flexible, you know, for us, uh, Terminology is just a means for communication. So it doesn't matter uh, what terminology you want to use. We're comfortable with anything. As long as we're conveying the correct idea and the same idea, you know, whether you're planting a church or you're pioneering a church, it's okay. You know, however, whatever language uh, you're comfortable with, it's fine. But the objectives are clear. We want the self-sustaining community of believers in various parts of the city so that they can nurture, equip, host the presence of God and influence their region and be do it in a very self-sustaining manner. That means they are growing and they're able to do this on their own. So to summarize, what are some of the key objectives here in planting or pioneering local churches in urban centers in our cities? He said, we want to establish and host the presence of God in that place. We want to disciple new believers, we want to influence. And of course, we want to multiply. We want to be able to, you know, that one church can then, as it becomes self-sustaining, become uh, like a mother church and plant more churches. I want to pause here before I go forward to uh, take up any questions uh, anybody may have, uh, any thoughts on this so far. Any questions? Everyone's okay. All right. Uh, if there are no questions, I will um, go on to the next chapter. Feel free to uh, interrupt uh, uh, anytime and uh, you know ask your questions as we talk about this. And uh, yeah, this is you know this whole topic of uh, church planting is, is something very special because I, I see it as a very powerful way uh, to impact cities, you know, uh, to transform cities. Uh, you know, uh, sure, we, you know, conferences are good, seminars are good, uh, you know, having gospel meetings are good, they all serve their purpose. But if you want to talk about something that will be a sustained effort to impact a city, then we need to think in terms of the church, the community, establishing this community of believers in the city. And now, uh, we could, it could be in the form of the local church, or it could be in the form of some other kind of ministry. You know, maybe it's a ministry, a specialized ministry for children, maybe it's a specialized ministry for the youth, for the adults, for married couples, for the elderly, you know, you could have many different kinds of ministries. And we will, you know, talk about some of these things. Uh, so whether it's a local church or whether it's a ministry, but if it's, if we want to have something sustained, uh, something that has sustained impact on the city, we need to think in terms of establishing these kinds of communities of believers and nurturing, equipping them 
so that they can be self-sustaining and impact uh, you know the city or at least part of the city for God's kingdom. Now as we progress in talking about urban church planting, pioneering churches, pioneering new ministries in the city, one very important thing is to have God's heart for cities. God's heart for cities. That means if you are serving God in a certain city, you know, whether it's Bangalore or you know, Kathmandu or Mysore or um, you know, whichever other city, Calcutta or uh, uh, whichever city you are in, or wherever God is sending you, first thing, before even you can start thinking about strategy and methods and various kinds of ministries, first thing is we must have God's heart for that city, right? And uh, I want to just spend some time in this chapter talking about that. It's very important. Uh, now, even the scriptures reveal to us that God has heart for the cities. Uh, we will look at some, some of these verses. If we go to Matthew chapter 5, can somebody read that for us? Uh, Matthew 5, 35. I, know, uh, uh, these, I could quote these verses and just go on, but I think it's, it's useful for us just to turn to them and read them because you know it's very powerful just reading the scriptures. Matthew 5 verse 35, somebody could read it, please. Nor by the earth, for it is the resting place for his feet, nor by the Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Mm, thank you, Aaron. So Jesus, of course, is saying, you know, don't swear by any anything at all. Uh, and then he in this as he's in this teaching, he says nor by Jerusalem, it is the city of the great king. Think about it. He's saying Jerusalem. Jerusalem, if you look at it from a natural standpoint, it's another city. You know, like whether you think about Bangalore or Delhi or Calcutta or New York or London or you know, uh, Singapore, or it's another city in this, geographically speaking, just another city. But he's saying, this is the city of the great king. As God is identifying himself and he's saying, you know, of all the cities on the earth, I'm picking that city. I have something to do with that city. It's a city of the great, it's my city. And uh, sure enough, uh, as we go towards the end of uh, the book of Revelation, we see that, you know, God is going to establish his presence there in the new heavens and the new earth. And you have this heavenly city of Jerusalem coming down and being established here on earth. So God identifies himself with a city. Now, that doesn't mean God is not interested in other cities on the earth. No, what we do see is that God has his eyes on every city because wherever their people are, God is interested and people are living in cities, large numbers of people living in cities. And when you look at some of the other examples in the Bible, uh, you think about Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's go to Genesis 18. Now, God was touched, or God in some way was, you know, if I want to, if we could use the word disturbed or unhappy about what he saw concerning Sodom and Gomorrah. So Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 and 21, somebody could read that for us, please. Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 and 21. Somebody read that for us, please. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because the their sin is very great, I will go down now and see, and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it, 
that have come to me and if not i will know mm. so genesis 18 2021 20, uh is telling us that god is concerned about the sins of the city right and god takes notice now don't get too caught up with the language here you know it tells us you know god is saying i'm going to go and look at it to see if it is so or not don't worry about that language because um god is omniscient and he doesn't have to you know come and visit every city in order to check things out in one instant at the same time he knows what is happening uh, across the whole world the point that I, that i want to emphasize here is that god is interested and god is observant god is seeing what is happening in the city uh, he knows the sin or the sinfulness and it is coming up before god he is not you know ignorant of what's happening in the city so in our city or in in the cities that you each one of you are living in if god was to look over your city uh what's he going to see what is the predominant thing in happening in that city you know and god is saying what would that be that you know rises up before that city now another this is about sodom and gomorrah another city many of us are familiar because of the story of jonah is the city of nineveh and so let's just uh, go across to, uh, to the old testament book of jonah and uh, uh, just look at you know a very similar uh, view of jonah of, of sorry of the city of nineveh can somebody read that for us please or look for the book of jonah um Jonah chapter 1 we're going to read at the beginning and the closing verses here Jonah chapter 1 verse 1 and 2 and then also we're going to look at Jonah chapter 4 verse 10 and 11 Jonah chapter 1 verse 1 and 2 I'll read pastor go ahead please the lord gave this message to Jonah a son of Amittai get up and go to the great city of Nineveh announce my judgment against it because i have seen how wicked its people are okay and then um, jonah chapter 4 verse 10 and 11 i'll read uh, then the lord said you feel sorry about the plant though you did not think to put it there it come quickly and died quickly but nineveh has more than 120000 people living in the spiritual darkness not to mention all the animals shouldn't i feel sorry for such a great city Hmm. So the book of Jonah is very very small book. Uh just a few chapters there. Uh of course, you know, we can look at it uh, uh by focusing on Jonah, the man, the prophet God had called um to go and deliver a message to the city. But we can also look at it from God's view of Nineveh. The opening verses which we just read god says you know look the wickedness has come before me uh, the, it means that like we had just mentioned even about sodom and gomorrah god is very observant god is very aware of what's happening in the city and he's saying that their wickedness you know uh, has come up before me meaning it is alarming it's got my attention and i want a messenger i want them to go in and speak to them now of course jonah you know you know the story of jonah when you come to the end of that book in jonah chapter 4 verse 10 and 11 as jonah feels more sorry about you know his own personal condition and what's happened to um the plant that uh, gave him shade and so on uh, and and god is saying to jonah aren't you concerned on this great city 
So Jonah's worried about his condition, about his situation, about the plant and so on. Uh, but he didn't seem to have any concern for the city itself. And so God is asking Jonah. Now remember Jonah was sent as a messenger of God. He was sent to bring a message from God. But somehow he lost sight of the people to whom he was bringing the message. He lost sight of the city to whom he was sent. And he was so taken up by his situation, his condition, and the thing that was of usefulness to him. That's what he was concerned about. He forgot about the city. He forgot about the people. And in conclusion, the very last verse, God is telling Jonah, Jonah, for me, I'm looking at Nineveh, the city. I'm looking at the thousands of people there. I'm looking at this 120,000 people. I'm looking at all the people there and not to mention all the livestock. And that's what I'm concerned about. So the thing that I want to highlight here is, you know, what God wants us to have is his heart for the city. Now, how wonderful it would have been if Jonah was able to look at things the way God was looking at it, at things. But, you know, he had forgotten all, or he had just missed all that. And we should not let that happen to us. We are messengers of God. We are bringing his word, or we are carrying out his ministry in the city. Uh, and, and in doing that, we shouldn't be so focused on ourselves or on the things that are important to us. I'm not saying don't take care of yourself. We need to take care of ourselves. Uh, there are things that will be important to us. We need to attend to it, yes. But don't lose sight of the city and the people in it. Right? Learn to have God's heart for the city. So a prayer that I pray often is God, what do you want for this city? How do you want us to serve this city? How do you want us to, you know, reach people in this city? What do you want us to do in this city? I pray the same thing about our nation and the nations. So God, what, what, what do you want us to do in the city of Bangalore? What do you want us to do in India? What do you want us to do for the nations? Right? Because we need to be able to see things the way God is saying. Otherwise, like Jonah, we'll be only focused on our situation, our condition, and those th little things that are of importance or usefulness to us. And we forget that the reason God has placed us in the city is to be his voice to the city, to be his ministers to the city. We, we could easily get, you know, forget that. So I want to help, you know, just remind us that throughout our journey, of ministry, we must make sure that we have God's heart for the city. In Luke 19, let's go to Luke 19. We see something very interesting in the ministry of Jesus. Uh, we will read verses 41 to 44. Luke 19, verses 41 to 44. Somebody could read that out for us, please. Maybe somebody who hasn't read yet so far. Luke 19, verses 41 to 44. Somebody could read that. I'll read it, sir. All right. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you even, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Hmm. Verse 41 
is very thank you thank you for reading that verse 41 is very very touching it says jesus knew drew close to the city a city of jerusalem he saw the city so he looked over it he considered all that was happening and he wept over it he wept over the city that's very touching. I wonder whether we weep over the cities in which we live. Has, it been, has there been a time when you saw your city, and I say saw your city, I means just consider in your mind's eye, you can you know, just have a bird's eye view or you know, uh, an overview of your city, and as you see your city, does it move you? Does it move you to tears? Do you weep over your city? Because Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. And uh, this is one record for us here. We don't know if he wept over the city many times. We don't know if he also wept over some of the other cities where he went to minister to. This is just one record for us. It's showing us his heart. For the city. I want to you know, encourage us that we should be such people who have a heart for the city and the city should move us. It should move our hearts. God, I must do something here. God, something must, it needs to happen in our city. The city is so big and there's so many millions of people and they need to hear the gospel. They need to know Jesus. They need. They are going through difficulties. Um, they need help. I mean, there's so many things that, that, and these things should move our heart. Now, sometimes uh, we can get very hard towards the city, meaning the problems of the city can really aggravate us, make us angry. You know, uh, the roads are bad. Uh, there is no order. A um, lot of heavy traffic, a lot of congestion, uh, you know, all kinds of things. We can complain about pollution. We can complain about different things. And sometimes, you know, when we look at all these negative things, we tend to become hard towards the city. Uh, you know, we don't care about the city because all these problems, man, I have to put up with all these things uh, while I'm living here. But I want us to be careful about that. And instead of being hardened towards the city, may we have a very tender heart towards our city. Where we can cry, where we can weep over the city, and we can say, God, what do you want us to do for the city? Now, if you examine this passage a little bit more carefully, you know, oh, we could ask ourselves the question, you know, why did Jesus weep? over the city of Jerusalem. Of course, there are many unsaid things. That means there could be many other things than what is stated here, which would have moved his heart uh, to weep over the city of Jerusalem. Uh, but if you go by what has been stated here in these verses that we read, uh, why do you think Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem? And I just want to hear your thoughts. Why do you think Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem? You could just unmute your mic and say, speak if you want. Something different and something wrong ha happened over there. So. Uh, when you say something different, and uh, meaning, can you explain that a little bit for us, please? Something different, so like uh, the church, Jerusalem, the church, it was uh, over there, the uh, some priest, and they were like uh, selling some different, different things, you know, but that that is place for worshipping. So All right, so different. you're, okay, okay, I, you're looking at, yeah, you're looking at verses 45, 46, right, like when Jesus sees the temple, he's uh, the synagogue, and uh, and in, in this case, the temple in Jerusalem, he sees people buying and selling. And uh, Okay, yes, I'm sure that would have, uh, that did affect his, you know, his, 
him emotionally, and we know what happened was 45 to 48, if Anthony, uh, you know, draw out the people who were buying and selling. Okay, um, that, that could be a part of why he wept. But if you look at these verses that we read, then it, the passage we read, what do we see? What you're saying is valid, and what you said is valid, that he must have been moved and affected by, you know, all the people buying and selling in the temple. Um, Actually, he, yeah, they didn't recognize the day. That's what it mentioned. Uh, mm. uh, only was what we read. If you only mm. could recognize that this day, peace. Mm. Right. They, did, they failed to recognize the Jesus. Yeah. So Jesus weeping over the city because, you know, it's like God has come to you, to the city here. And they just are not able to recognize it. They are missing out on their day of visitation. God has come to visit them. They don't know God's come. And therefore they're losing out on the things that would make for their peace. You know, the things that would bless them, bring them peace. They can't see it. Their eyes are blinded. And, uh, and, and, and so Jesus is weeping over the city because they're really missing out on what God is doing for the people in the city. The people in the city cannot recognize it. And that's what's touching, moving his heart, you know. So, and so he weeps over the city. So really it's the spiritual blindness. If you want to sum it up with one word or, you know, a, a, a statement. The spiritual blindness of the people in the city moved his heart and he's weeping because they're not able to see, they're not able to recognize what God is doing in their midst. They're blinded and therefore they're missing out on things that would make for their peace and um, then they, they, they're actually going to face destruction. Right? So he's moved by that. The underlying issue is spiritual blindness. So what I just want to say is, you know, when we see the spiritual condition of our cities, of course, there are a lot of other natural things. You know, the city could have a lot of natural problems, social problems, social tensions, all of that. And those are real issues. I'm not you know, negating that. But when we see the spiritual condition of our city, like Jesus did, can we weep over that? You know, will that, does that move us? The spiritual condition of the cities in which we live. So, you know, we're going to stop here and uh, we will take this forward tomorrow. Um, but I want us to you know, I just want to leave us with this thought and saying, God, give me your heart for the city in which I am in. Help me to see the city with your eyes. And like how God saw Sodom and Gomorrah, he saw Nineveh, he saw the people. Like Jesus saw the city of Jerusalem. And then God, give me your heart. May I be able to, may I be moved by the spiritual condition of the city. The, the fact that people are not able to see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact that people, their eyes are blinded. They don't know the gospel, the things that could bring them peace, the things that could heal them, things that could deliver them, things that could make them whole. They don't know. God opened my eyes. Uh, God moved my heart for this, about this. Okay. I want us to just take a few moments to pray before we close this class. We're going to talk more on this tomorrow. And um, can somebody pray for us? You know, each one of us are in various cities uh, around India. Dave is in Kathmandu and 
there would be students on our e-learning portal who would be from various parts of the world who would listen to this lecture. Um, can somebody just pray and say, God, help give us your heart for the cities in which you have placed us and called us to serve you. Could somebody pray for us and then dismiss, please? I'll pray, Pastor. God, Aaron. Thanks. Thank you, Father, for giving us this um, privilege to study church, urban church planting, Lord. Lord, as we as you have called us to be your voice to the nation, to the city whites, Lord. Lord, as we journey with this course and go more deeper, Lord, Father, each day, help us to be more sensitive, Lord, Father, with the Spirit. And Lord, give us your zeal, Lord, Father. Give us, give us zeal and fullness, Lord, Father, to stand in the cape for the worldwide. And Lord, 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 I pray for the pastor, Lord Father. Lord, give him a fresh revelation, Lord Father, as as he will prepare each and every single day, Lord Father, to teach us. And Lord, Lord Father, I pray for each and every single one of us that, Lord Father, I believe that, Lord Father, you will give us your heart, Lord Father. Thank you so much for for your love, Lord Father, and Lord Father, open our eye, open our spiritual eye, heart, Lord Father, to understand better, Lord Father. In Jesus' most precious name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, everyone, for being part of the class today. And uh, we will um, see you again tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy.